Good morning and peace to you. Welcome to First United Methodist Church of Roseville where we do our best to live into the gospel of love as a community committed to offering hope to this world. Now this is the last Sunday of the Epiphany season and things seem to have gone so quickly. We began with a message from our district superintendent, Blake Busick. We went on to visit with our beloved Kufour family and talked about culture and devotion, love and service. We then had to contemplate the light of Epiphany in the context of the darkness of the events that occurred at our nation's capital. We then took the time to lift up the need for rest and renewal as we visited our modern day fortress of solitude and spent time with Larry and Grace. Of course, our connectional friends and faith family in Loomis welcomed us. And last week, we had a rich time speaking with Fran Burton, absorbing her wisdom and exploring the truth that God's wonder-working presence is as accessible as acknowledging the music in the air, the music that is right over our head. Indeed, it has been a rich season of exploring how Christ is revealed or shines throughout the world, even in a time that is layered in as complex as these. Today, we'll begin to make a pivot towards the next season in our liturgical calendar, which is Lent. But first, let us sing as we open with the song appropriately titled, Come Let Us Sing. sing that and other songs again in the same place under the same roof. It will happen, trust me. We just need to be patient 
a little bit longer. So within the liturgical calendar, today is usually called Transfiguration Sunday for reasons obvious. The gospel text in the lectionary calls for us to contemplate the story of when Jesus was on the mountaintop with his trusted disciples, Peter, James, and John, and how he was transfigured or changed before them while draped in light and how these disciples saw this incredible sight of Jesus meeting his ancestors, Moses, and of course, Elijah. And in this blazing demonstration, Jesus was affirmed as God's beloved in whom they should listen. Now, last year we talked about that a bit. So today we're gonna go and shift to another story. In fact, we'll highlight someone who was in that narrative, Elijah. But let us hear the lectionary text for this week that is found within the Hebrew Scriptures. Okay. Our scripture today comes from the second chapter in 2 Kings, verses 1 through 12. Elijah ascends to heaven. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elijah were on their way to Gilgal. Elijah said to Elijah, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elijah said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elijah and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elijah, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elijah and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elijah said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended into a whirlwind into heaven. Elijah kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. The word of God for the people of God. That is an amazing story. Let us back up a bit and give a little context. I mean, the passage begins abruptly by announcing a transition in prophetic leadership. It says God was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind. Now, Elijah was a big deal and he occupies a central place in the stories of the 9th century BCE Israel. He was an outsider, but a provocateur who antagonized both the political power structures and even some of the religious folk, sometimes termed, termed as the company of prophets. 
I remember reading these arch books when I was a kid. They were these children Bible story books. And my absolute favorite was the one where Elijah was going up against the prophets of Baal. It was a great story. Elijah, in his final days, is shown in 2 Kings, at least how the biblical writers understood it. And it possibly informs the transfiguration story by the gospel writers many centuries later. For instance, in this text, as in, in earlier stories, Elijah demonstrates Moses-like abilities, having already chosen his successor, as Moses chose Joshua at the end of Numbers, Elijah tests Elisha's dedication and leads him across the Jordan, parting the waters on his way out of Israel. Elijah mimics Moses' own actions at the Red Sea. Elijah's point of departure from this earthly life, as some scholar noted, is roughly the same as Moses' point of departure, somewhere in the general vicinity of Mount Nebo. Now, a few years ago, I spent some time at and around Mount Nebo, and as I read this story this week, my memory became alive again, just knowing that though we do not know for sure how these things happened in reality, we do know that it was rooted in a historical time and place and spoke to the truth of the experience of a particular people. And it was really hot. The desert is hot. And in this, the climax of this narrative, you have the arrival of this fiery chariot of Yahweh that carries Elijah away. The scholarship of religious studies professor, Dr. Amy Merrill Willis, and others note how the Canaanite culture propagated by Ahab and Jezebel asserted that Baal, or Baal, was the one who rode the cloud chariot, who brought powerful winds and rains and fire and lightning. Therefore, in, in, even in Elijah's final moments, the chariot of fire becomes a rebuke to the religious and political system that he fought all throughout his life and ministry. The scene of Elijah's ascension is elaborate. Again, a chariot of fire and horses of fire that separated Elijah and Elisha. Then Elijah, again, ascending in a whirlwind and Elisha crying out, Father, Father, I mean, not meaning a biological relationship, but rather a common ancient Semitic kinship terminology towards a superior figure. I mean, this dramatic scene of deliverance has captured the imagination all throughout history. In particular, I think how it informed one of the most important spirituals within the African-American religious tradition called Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. And we are familiar with those words. Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, coming forth to carry me home. The song is attributed to Wallace Willis sometime before 1862, who was an enslaved person from the Oklahoma area. His inspiration was the land beyond the Ohio River. Like other songs of resistance, the spiritual encoded language that would have been familiar to those enslaved, for home could mean either heaven or a land of freedom. The lines, I looked over Jordan and what did I see? Coming for to carry me home, a band of angels coming after me. It could refer specifically to the town of Ripley, Ohio, which was a station on the Underground Railroad across the Ohio River. Or it could refer to something more general. Or it could even refer to the process of dying and transitioning and passing from this life into the afterlife. This is William H. Johnson's painting from 1944. In this picture entitled Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, a line of fashionable angels welcomes a man to heaven. 
Having arrived by horse-driven chariot, he greets them with open arms. Another painting shows mourners hovering over a deathbed visibly through the open door of a cabin. And you see angels descend to take the newly departed soul to heaven in a chariot. Queen of Stolville shows a funeral scene within the African-American experience. And this one is my favorite, also made in 1944 by J. Kelly Fitzpatrick. Um, it shows the concept of swing, swing low, sweet chariot within a church setting. I, I show all this to explain that this dramatic scene in biblical history near Mount Nebo on the other side of the Jordan has been used to fuel the most public movements of freedom and to bring comfort in the most private, grief-filled moments of saying, Goodbye. And yet, at the heart of all of this, there is something so much more intimate there. For before the whirlwind, there was a walk. Before the chariot, there was companionship. And before the fire, there was friendship. Even when we look at the story that occurs at the Mount of Transfiguration, we must not overlook the walk there. Scripture says in Mark uh, chapter 9, verse 2, that after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. Now, I have seen those hills in northern Israel, and it is a, not an easy go to even think about going up those hills or what they called mounts. And it truly says something that Jesus said to his closest disciples slash friends, come walk with me, let us be alone. And even in our narrative for today, though you have Elijah repeatedly saying to Elisha, his understudy, don't go with me, you stay here. You have Elisha being insistent on not leaving Elijah. He says, in a dramatic way, he says, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself lives, I will not leave you. He then followed him from Gilgal to Bethel, to Jericho, all the way to the Jordan River and beyond. To be honest, I don't think that Elijah wanted to be alone as he knew he was about to be take it away. I believe that he was kind of trying to be tough for the moment, maybe try to be a little stoic, maybe try to spare his apprentice, who he knew loved him, the pain of seeing him die, or whatever was going to happen. But there Elisha was, and before the whirlwind, they walked. And before the chariot, there was companionship. And before the fire, there was friendship. Now I will not linger too much longer on this, but the importance of friendship cannot be understated. We elevate, and rightly, the moments of fiery chariots in the whirlwinds, and even those moments of transfiguration in our lives. These are those pivotal moments. These are those moments that stick with us. It could be those moments of high inspiration, or as Howard Thurman says, those moments of high resolve. It could be a time when we experience transcendency, like a conversion testimony, like Paul being knocked off his horse in blinding light style, like those times when you feel connected to your purpose and turned around to start something new. Or it could be those hard times, those defining times of pain, like when a loved one has died, or where we are experiencing the grief of loss, or even the loss of what is familiar, like what many people are experiencing today under this pandemic. We have these moments, these big moments in our lives, be they good or ill, and we tend to want to make a marker to commemorate it, 
to make a tent as they did at the Mount of Transfiguration. But what I am suggesting to you today is this, is that you never get to any point in your life by yourself. If you look, then you will see that along the way, there was a community or a friend who was present. And even in your lowest moments, what allows you to get through it, beyond just the passage of time, is the presence of a friend or a companion who was willing to either walk up the mountain with you or cross the Jordan River in your time right before the whirlwind. The invitation today is to be that friend, that companion for others, to be the person who someone can turn to when they need someone to accompany them on their journey. The friend who will say, as Elisha said to Elijah, I will not leave you. Now we all have these stories about someone who was there for us in that way, but I will tell you, being this for someone, knowing that there are folks in our lives who were Elisha for us, is much more than just being a good person. You become an embodiment of God's grace or God's reminder that you are not alone. This truth is echoed in a poem by Maya Angelou that you will hear later. But for now, as we close, let us consider the words of the great author and mystic Khalil Gibran, who wrote in his famous book, The Prophet. He says, friends are your needs answered. They are your field which you sow with love and reap with thanksgiving. And let there be no purpose in friendship save the deepening of the spirit. And in the sweetness of friendship, let there be laughter and sharing of pleasures. For in the dew of little things, the heart finds its morning and is refreshed. Before the whirlwind, there was a walk. And before the chariot, there was companionship. And before the fire, there was friendship. May we be willing to swing low and be sweet chariots of grace to those in need of accompaniment. And may we be angels of hope to carry those longing for a place of home. Amen. Lying, thinking, last night, how to find my soul a home where water is not thirsty and bread loaf is not stone. I came up with one thing and I don't believe I'm wrong, that nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. Alone, all alone, nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. There are millionaires with money that they can't use. Their wives run around like banshees, their children sing the blues. They've got expensive doctors to cure their hearts of stone. But nobody, but nobody can make it out here alone. Alone, all alone. Nobody, but nobody can make it out here alone. Now, if you listen closely, I'll tell you what I know. Storm clouds are gathering. The wind is going to blow. The race of man is suffering, and I can hear their moan. Because nobody, but nobody can make it out here alone. Alone, all alone. Nobody, but nobody can make it out here alone. Thank you. Let us pray. My prayer is that we will always remember that we are not alone. That not only is God with us, but that God hears us and our prayers. So today we are holding in prayer all those who are sick and all those who are saddled with anxieties. I pray that as a community, we will be a people who walks with those who are in need of companionship and friendship along the journey. In all things, may we find your grace and strength. May we move in gratitude and joy. And now as we navigate the rest of this week, may we do what Micah extolled, which was to do justice, to love mercy, 
and walk humbly with God. In your holy name we pray. Amen. And now, may you go with God, and may you go in God's peace.